Good morning and welcome to our worship. I'm Heidi Rader, the traditional music leader here at Aldersgate, and our first song is going to be Angels from the Realms of Glory. Angels from the realms of glory
Well, good morning, Aldersgate. I am Pastor Chris Williams, and I hope this day finds you well, wherever you may be joining with us today. We know that we'd rather be here together, but still God's Spirit joins us no matter where we are. just want to share with you some things going on in the life of our church. Uh, as always, remind you to stay connected, to get the information and updates, whether that may be through social media, emails, text messages. Just make sure that you are connected to hear what's going on. Uh, things seem like they change all of the time. Uh, we do have some big events that are upcoming, and let me tell you about those for a moment. First of all, I want to tell you about next Sunday, that is the 20th, uh, we will be offering drive through communion uh, between services, so from 9.30 to 10.30 in the morning. Uh, so if you watch this service, you can come by afterwards, or if you go to Contemporary, come beforehand. We'll be outside in the front area. You can drive up. We're going to provide you with communion that we have blessed that you can take with you, as well as Christmas Eve kits. We put together a little something for you to have in your time of worshiping Christmas Eve, wherever you may be. So I just invite you to come by. Tell us how many you have, and we'll provide those for you. Then we'll let you know that our Christmas Eve worship, we have two services that will be online. Uh, our contemporary service will be available beginning at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night, December 23rd. You can join in. It'll go live then. And then our traditional service will go live at 4 p.m. on Thursday, Christmas Eve. Uh, as always, you can watch those on Facebook or YouTube, and you can find them afterwards on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you want to catch up on it, watch it at a different time. So I invite you to be a part of that. And invite a friend to join in and worship uh, with you to watch wherever they may be. Uh, so this is a couple things that are going in the life of our church. I know if you fast forward a little bit, on the 27th of December, we'll have one service uh, that will go live at 10 o'clock that morning. Just a combined service as we continue in our celebration. I uh, also want to say thank you to those who continue to support the ministry of Aldersgate for your great faithfulness, the ways that you give. Uh, and obviously you can do that through mail, through online, through texting, and thank you for that faithfulness. Uh, finally, as always, make sure to lift up the prayers, and if you have prayer requests, send them to us, call them in the office, email, and we'll be glad to share those with our prayer chain. But let us take a moment, though, to take a time of prayer. As we are in the midst of the hustle and bustle of the seas, and as we are running around trying to get that last-minute shopping done, and decorations and all that we're trying to prepare, let us just calm ourselves and open our spirit to God's spirit. Certainly we have a number of things that are upon our hearts and minds this day, and we're going to begin, as always, with this a moment of silent prayer. Let's take a moment to take a deep breath and focus on a name or a word that represents a particular prayer in your life, and then we'll come together and close with the Lord's Prayer. So with a deep breath, let us come to God in prayer. Holy and loving God, we give thanks this day. We give thanks to you for the love that you pour out into our lives. We give thanks for your presence with us, even when we are often too busy to recognize you right there. Certainly that is one of our prayers, Lord, that we be more aware of your presence. Not just in the big ways that we're always looking for, but in the little everyday kinds of ways. The reminders that through good, through bad, through just the mundane of life, you are still God and you are still with us. That's what we celebrate, right? You coming to be present with us. As always, Lord, we pray your presence for those in our personal lives, our families, our community, and in the world, those who are hurting those who are grieving, those who are just struggling and feeling lost and wandering. Just pray, God, that you would be there to speak a word, to bring comfort, to bring that healing and understanding. And I pray, God, that as we, you're, you're faithful, that we would continue to bear your presence in the world, to bear your light 
in the midst of the darkness. And so we come now, God, from different places, different homes this morning, but yet somehow joined together by your spirit and love as we pray to you that prayer that Jesus taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would someday walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come? was a crumb that was even too small for a mouse. Then he did the same thing to the other whose houses, leaving crumbs much too small for the other whose mouses. You nauseate me, Mr. Grinch, with a nauseous super nauseous. You're a crooked, jerky jockey, and you drive a crooked hoss, Mr. Grinch. Your soul is an appalling dump heap, overflowing with the most disgraceful assortment of rubbish imaginable, mangled up in tangled up knots. Owl one, Mr. 
Grinch. You're a nasty, wasty skunk. Your heart is full of unwashed socks. Your soul is full of gunk, Mr. Grinch. The three words that best describe you are as follows, and I quote, Stink, stank, stunk. It was a quarter of dawn, all the who's still a bed, all the who's still a snooze, when he packed up his sled, packed it up with their presents, their ribbons, their wrappings, their snoof and their fuzzles, their tringlers and trappings. <laughs> feet up. Up the side of Mount Crumpet, he rode with his load to the tip-top to dump it. He was grinchily humming. They're finding out now that no Christmas is coming. They're just waking up. I know just what they'll do. Their mouths will hang open a minute or two. Then the who's down in who will will all cry boo hoo. <laughs> you know, over the last several months, there is uh, something that I have heard kind of over and over as we have gone through all of this and come upon different holidays in our society. Something along the lines of, well, fill in whatever the holiday is. Yeah, it's just not going to happen this year. You know, I've heard things like, oh, we're going to have to cancel Halloween. We just can't have Halloween this year with the stuff going on in the world. Or, oh, there's not going to be Thanksgiving this year. No, it's just not going to be Thanksgiving. And now, you know, I've even heard a few people say, well, Christmas just isn't going to come this year. Not with all the stuff that we're dealing with. It's just not going to happen. Which is really just our way of saying, well, things aren't going to be the way that we want them to be. The way that we're used to being. Maybe some traditions just don't get to get carried on this year. And so we all say, well, you know, Christmas just won't happen this year. Except we all need to be reminded of that lesson that the Grinch learned. When he tried to steal Christmas is that, Christmas still comes, and there is nothing that we do or don't do, nothing going on in the world that will ever change that. And that's what we're talking about today as we continue in our Grinchmas series. And today I want to turn to the Luke's, Luke's gospel to hear the announcement of the birth of Jesus to Mary. We find it in Luke chapter 1. Hear these words. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favor one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. 
Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed her. Turning back to the prophet Isaiah, the ninth chapter, we hear these two verses. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of the hosts will do this. May God bless the reading, the hearing, our understanding of his word. Just take a moment to pray for and with me. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, our God, my strength and our redeemer. For this I pray in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, several years ago, my home church got invited to take part in a Christmas parade. Our town that we were a part of decided they wanted to do this, this new kind of thing they were putting on for the community. Never mind the fact that it's in early December when it's really, really cold out. Not exactly parade weather in my mind, but hey, they wanted to do it. And as the church and a community like that, we wanted to support our community. So we said, sure, We'll be a part of it. We'll put together a float uh, to participate in the parade. So then we began to discuss, okay, what would our float look like? What, what, what could we do to be a part of a Christmas parade? And after a little discussion and thought, we said, well, we are a church, so it just kind of makes sense that we would do like a nativity scene. So we had someone in the church that had a flatbed trailer, you know, like the kind that you would carry a, a car on. We had some bells of hay we put in there, a little manger with the baby doll Jesus. Uh, not to, to brag or anything, but, you know, my wife and I did get cast as Mary and Joseph for the parade. Mostly that meant is that we were willing to sit out there and freeze. So, you know, hey, but uh, for a couple theater people, we'll take the roles that we can get. We also had a couple of kids that had some costumes to be shepherds. And for our little extra touch, we had a pole with a star on top of it to be above our little manger scene. That was it. That was our nativity and our float for the Christmas parade. Of course, we get ready for it. On the night of the parade, there was an area where all the floats were supposed to go to stage and get ready. And as we pulled up and started getting our stuff together and looking around at the other participants, how shall I put this? Imagine for a moment that you show up to a black tie formal event and you're wearing blue jeans and a t-shirt. That's kind of how we felt about our little float. I mean, there were some incredible floats that were going to be a part of this. Very detailed, all kinds of participants from the community. The fire department was there with their trucks and the lights flashing. You know, from a nearby base that brought some military vehicles in to be a part of it. The school band was going to be there. You know, we even had another church in the community that did a float. And they did a whole Grinch theme. They had a sleigh for their float. They had a Grinch. They had all kinds of people from the church who were all decked out in like who costumes, all running around. I mean, it was so intricate. And I'm looking at our bells of hay and who we got a star, right? You know, but maybe biggest of all, and I say that literally and figuratively, was the giant shopping cart. And I don't mean just a giant shopping cart. I mean a shopping cart that you can drive. We actually have a picture. You can take a look at this thing. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the exact same one. I think it is that we had in the parade back then. It was Price Chopper. But picture that giant, what is it, two-story uh, shopping cart that you can drive. And it was covered in blue Christmas lights. You could not miss that thing if you wanted to. And it literally was the focal point of the parade. And pretty much, I think that sums it up, doesn't it? I mean, a giant shopping cart adorned in Christmas lights, doesn't that really capture Christmas today for most of us? You know, really, I love Christmas, and I love all of the stuff that goes into it. But I would even have to admit that Christmas is like this machine that just chews up and spits out everything else. It's kind of like a snowball, right? You know, it starts usually about July, if you go to some of the craft stores, you'll start seeing some decoration supplies coming out for the crafters, and it starts to take up momentum. 
Then as you get back to school and into September, pretty much you start seeing stores, you know, with displays and, you know, start to hear a little bit, some uh, commercials on the radio and TV. Then you get to November, and now that snowball has really taken on life, hasn't it? And you've got Christmas songs and movies, and people are well into their Christmas shopping. Decorations are going up, and by the time you get in December, there is nothing that stands in its way. I mean, that is what Christmas has become. All of the parties and the decorations and the presents. At least, that's certainly what the Grinch thought. That if you're going to think about Christmas, what is Christmas? It's all of that, right? It's the parties and the decorations and the candies and the presents, all of it. Of course, we all know the story of the Grinch. And whatever version you like, whether it's the, uh, the book from Dr. Seuss, the original animated show, the, the live action movie, Jim Carrey, or the, the animated movie that came out a couple of years ago with the voice of Benedict Cumberbatch. Regardless of which version you watch or like, it's basically the same. The Grinch wants to stop Christmas from coming. He wants to cancel Christmas. So how do you do that, right? How do you keep Christmas from coming? Well, in the Grinch's mind, well, what are all the things that make up Christmas, right? It's the presents, the treats, and so that's what he does. The Grinch goes about his way on Christmas Eve and steals all of it, every little bit of it, every wreath from the door, the trees, and the ornaments, and the light, the presents, even the food for Christmas dinner. He takes it all. And without any of that stuff, then obviously there can't be Christmas, right? There's no way that Christmas can come. And yet, we know what happens, don't we? Despite the fact that he stole all of the stuff, Christmas did still come. And he begins to learn that, you know, Christmas really is about more than all of the stuff we often make it out to be, more than just the presents and decorations and giant shopping carts. And we, in faith, know that Christmas really is about a child who was born to us. We hear the announcement of that birth to a young maiden named Mary in Luke's gospel. Last week, we talked about another announcement, the announcement to Joseph. Matthew gives us that account as the the angel appeared to Joseph to tell him that he was to be the father. But here in Luke's gospel, we get the angel appearing to a maiden named Mary to tell her what God is going to do through her. Now, we don't know a lot about Mary other than there's something within her that makes God choose her. You know, if we look at verse number 30 in our scripture, Luke's gospel there, this is the greeting that the angel says when he appears. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You have found favor. There's something about you that God has chosen you for this incredible honor. Now, again, we don't know much about her other than the fact that she's not the person you might expect. At least from the outside, there was nothing special about Mary. She's very poor. She's very humble. She wasn't even married yet, right? She was engaged, but she wasn't even married yet. She wasn't one of the elite. She wasn't one of the powerful. Everything that you might imagine who would give this great honor to, yeah, she didn't check any of those boxes that we might put. But yet there was something more profound within her. In Matthew's gospel, we're told us that Joseph was a righteous man. If Joseph was righteous, we can be certain Mary was righteous. If Joseph was a godly man, there is no doubt that Mary was a godly woman. And God chose her, her, to bear God's son. A son, a child like no other. If we look there in in our, our reading The angel tells her that this will be a child like no other. Picking up at verse number 32, the angel says, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. This 
is what Christmas is about. This child who was born to us. A child that was foretold years before the angel appeared to Mary. We think about the prophet Isaiah who tells about what God was going to do and just who this child would be. If we look at verse number 6 from Isaiah 9, Isaiah says this, For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is Christmas. You can't stop Christmas because Christ has already come. You can't mess up Christmas because Christmas is about what God has done, not about what we've done, but what God has done for us, in us, through us. You can't cancel Christmas. You can't ruin Christmas because Christmas is about Jesus. You know, look what the, the angel says, verse number 37, just that little reminder for all of us who, who want to say, oh, Christmas can't come. The angel says, verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing. No powers that be, no craziness in the world that we live in, nothing can stop or cancel or ruin Christmas. Sure, maybe the celebrations are different. Maybe some traditions don't get upheld again. But that's not what Christmas is. Christmas always has to go back to Jesus. Now, I've made it well known how I feel about cliches, right? Especially Christmas cliches. I've talked about our former bishop, Bishop Robert Schneezy, and some of his practices around Christmas cliches. You know, I just hate when I hear things like, Jesus is the reason for the season. And yet, as much as it pains me, it's right. I hate the way that it's so cliche and, you know, almost Dr. Susie in that sense, but it's true. It really is about Jesus, about a child who was born for us. And in the midst of the fanfare that Christmas so often is, we simply cannot lose sight of that. You know, years ago during that parade, we got going, and again, I was kind of embarrassed, right? Our little float there, and, you know, it's like, wow, compared to everything else, whew, uh, almost didn't really want to be a part of that. But we get lined up, we're going down the streets, and people are lined up and cheering. It was a great turnout for the parade. And there was a, an MC, you know, kind of a grandstand, and as we would go by, you know, he would talk about whatever float was out front, give a description, people would cheer about it. It was a great time. And I kept thinking as we were getting closer and I could hear him like, boy, he's going to have his work cut out for him. He's going to earn his money trying to, you know, spruce up our little float that's here in the middle of all of this. But as we came up to the section and pulled up in front of him, everything got quiet. It wasn't like lots of laughters and cheers and yelling. And after a pause, he said, and here we have a reminder of what Christmas is really about. There's a few more seconds of just stillness. And as we moved on along, the next float came and the cheers returned and the descriptions. And I have to say I, that stuck with me. And I, I reflected upon that in the days and the weeks ahead. And I began to realize, you know, I think it was good that we had such a meager little float there. Because Christmas really isn't about all that other stuff at the end of the day. It really goes back to that child who was born to us. And we simply cannot lose sight of that. It is upon us and our faith in the midst of the craziest of the world to make sure, to use another cliche, that we keep Christ in Christmas. Then when we find ourselves saying, oh, God, Christmas just can't be the same. Oh, Christmas just won't happen. It's going to be ruined this year. When we find ourselves saying those things this year or any year, just to remind ourselves, actually, no, Christmas is perfect because Jesus 
is perfect. And we just have to find a way in the midst of the season, in the midst of the hustle and bustle and all of the other stuff that the Grinch would want to steal to remind ourselves of that fact. You know, as you journey over these next uh, less than two weeks now, as we get close, make sure that you make room in your celebrations for Jesus. Take time, read the, the, the scriptures that tell us about Christmas, the reminders of what God was doing. Sing the Christmas songs, and not just the ones about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, but the ones that tell us about what God was doing. You know, maybe you have a, a nativity scene in the midst of your decorations. I know at our house we've got all kinds of lights and Santas and everything else, but we have a little nativity. No, it's not fancy, but neither was the original nativity. Just a little reminder that's there to say, you know, this is what Christmas is about. Maybe for you, it's hanging a chrismon or two on your tree. You know, chrismons are actually ornaments you hang on your tree, but they're shaped like symbols of our faith. You know, a cross, for example, or a dove or a butterfly, and there's numerous others. And maybe it's just having one of those two on your tree that, that maybe as you're looking at the tree and you're thinking about what Christmas is going to be or not be, maybe you're thinking about the presents just to remind you that's what Christmas is about. It's about that child that came and was born to a virgin named Mary. A child who was born for all of us. A child who is the Son of God. You know, throughout the season, we light the candles of the Advent wreath just to remind us of some of the themes. And, you know, there's pretty traditional themes that we have every year. This year we're doing something a little different few other little themes that are kind of along the way just to kind of remind us of something, other aspects, if you will, of our faith. You know, the first candle we lit for a candle of joy is to remind us that even when things are not going well in life, even in sorrow, there is still the joy of God in Christ Jesus. Last week we lit the candle, the second candle, as a candle of grace, reminding us of the grace of God in Jesus Christ for you and for us. Today, we want to light the third candle. We're going to light it as a candle of celebration. <laughs> this candle reminds us that regardless of what's going on in the world, good or bad, regardless of what our celebrations may look like, we still celebrate what God has done, what God is doing, and what we believe in faith God is still yet to do. Let us never lose sight of that. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, forgive us for the ways that we lose sight of your work in the world, for the ways that we too often get caught up in our, the ways that we celebrate what you've done and overlook the work that you have done. Forgive us the ways that we so often make Christmas about giant shopping carts and decorations when it's all about your son, Jesus. Help us to remember that, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
I pray now that God will bless you and keep you. I pray that you will go forth to bear the love of Christ in the world. Go in peace. Amen.
You're a vile one, Mr. Grinch. You have termites in your smile. You have all the tender sweetness of a seasick crocodile. choice between you, I take the seasick crocodile. My name is Jeremy Watson, and I, along with the First Light Band, would like to thank you for worshiping with Aldersgate this morning. Our sermon series this week is all about all things Mr. Grinch, so hats off to Amanda for that rendition of that tune made famous by Mr. Ravencroft. Um, we've got all sorts of good music this morning. Um, we are excited. It is the 13th of December, which means we are only a week and a half away from Christmas, and I don't know about you, but that raises my blood pressure a little bit. <laughs> Um, it's our hope that you are all healthy and comfortable, though, and that we are able to provide you with something positive and uplifting to help you get through your week. So here we go. We're going to start things off with something um, somewhat familiar, um, but do sing along at home. And uh, this one um, is a song called Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Here we go. One, two, one, two, ready, and...
heart longs for a little bit of hope. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Child prays for peace on earth, and she's calling out from a sea of hurt. Oh, come, oh, come. this morning. Thank you for this church and the people that make up this congregation. We ask that you watch over us this week and be with us as we make our way through this holiday season. We are so grateful for our continued health and ask that you watch over us with your protective care. We give thanks for our healthcare professionals and are filled with hope by their courage and their tenacity. 
Be with them as we fight the final weeks of this battle. And remind us that all, that this too shall pass. For many, as we wait in anticipation for the coming of the Christ child, this can be the happiest time of year. But we acknowledge that several of us are facing hardships this holiday. And some may be having a difficult time finding the spirit of Christmas. As the days get shorter and the nights grow longer, the sights and sounds of wildlife recede and things get very cold and quiet. The winter months remind us of the darkness present in our lives. Be with us, Lord. Remind us that you came to be a light in the darkness and to lead us from death to life. This holiday can end up becoming many things it wasn't intended to be. There's so much to do, to prepare, to give, to be. We can find ourselves exhausted and stressed and empty. We ask that you lead us to the manger and to restore and rejuvenate us, Lord. Help us to be a source of light to others. And may everything we say and do better serve the body of Christ. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, Allers Gate. I am Pastor Chris Williams, and as always, it is good to be joining with you in worship wherever this day may find you. Uh, as we gather today, I just want to share with you a few things going on in the life of the church. As always, encourage you to make sure that you stay connected and pay attention through social media and email, all the ways that we tend to communicate stuff happening in the life of our church. A couple of those things I want to tell you about right now. First, to let you know, next Sunday, we are going to have a drive through communion. So between the services from 9.30 to 10.30 in the morning, you can drive right up to the front of the church, and we're going to provide you with communion as well as a Christmas Eve kit. Just tell us how many you've got uh, and your household, how many you need, and we will provide those for you to take with you. Uh, if you can't make it next uh, Sunday morning, we'll also make it available on, uh, to get those kits on Monday morning as well. And so that would be the 20th and then the 21st. And I invite you to come be a part of that as we get ready. And speaking of Christmas Eve, let you know uh, our services. First of all, the contemporary Christmas Eve service will go live Wednesday, December 23rd at 7 o'clock. You can join us then, uh, as always, on Facebook and YouTube. The traditional service will go live at 4 p.m. on Christmas Eve. Uh, and obviously with both of those services, as all of our services, after the fact, you can still go back to YouTube and watch them and access that through our uh, website, aldersgatelife.com. Uh, finally, one more programming note, if you will. On December the 27th, which is the Sunday after Christmas, we're going to have one combined service that will go live at 10 o'clock that morning. So you can tune in as we continue in our celebration. Uh, again, those are some things coming up the life of the church. Also let you know, as always, thank you for your faithfulness and generosity. And you can continue to give that way by mail, through online, and through texting. But this time, let us continue just to offer our spirit to God's spirit in this time of worship. It was a quarter of dawn, all the who's still a bed, all the who's still a snooze, when he packed up his sled, packed it up with their presents, their ribbons, their wrappings, their snoof and their fuzzles, their tringlers and trappings. <laughs> feet up, up the side of Mount Crumpet, he rode with his load to the tip top to dump it.
Poopo to the Who's, he was grinchily humming. They're finding out now that no Christmas is coming. They're just waking up. I know just what they'll do. Their mouths will hang open a minute or two. Then the Who's down in Whoville will all cry, Boo-hoo. That's a noise, grinned the Grinch, that I simply must hear. You know, over the last several months, there's been a somewhat common refrain that I have heard from a few people, especially as we come up to every holiday along the way. Something along the fact of that particular holiday, well, it's just not going to happen this year. You know, things like, oh, Halloween's canceled. We're not going to be able to have Halloween this year. Or there's not going to be any Thanksgiving. Those happen. And now as we approach Christmas, I've even heard a few people say, ah, yeah, just not going to be Christmas this year. It's just not going to be, Christmas is not going to happen. Christmas isn't coming this year. Except you can't stop Christmas, right? That's the thing that the Grinch learned in the story is that no matter what happens, no matter how much things get disrupted, no matter how things go awry and we mess it up, no matter what's going on in the world around us, Christmas still comes. And we can never lose sight of that. Never forget that in the midst of all of our celebrations. And I want to talk about that today as we continue in our Grinchmas sermon series. And so we're going to turn to the Gospel of Luke as we hear about the announcement of the birth of Jesus to a young maid named Mary. In Luke chapter 1. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Then turning back to the prophet Isaiah, we hear these words. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. May God bless the reading, the hearing, our understanding of his word. Take a moment to pray for and with me. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, our God, my strength and our redeemer. For this I pray in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, several years ago, uh, my home church was invited to take part in a Christmas parade. Our hometown at that time decided they wanted to do something new, right? Some big community event. And they had this great idea that why don't we put on a Christmas parade? That'll be great and fun. Never mind the fact that it takes place in early December in the Midwest, and it's really, really cold out. Not exactly parade weather, but hey, they had the idea, they set it all up, and they invited businesses and people in the community to take part in that. So as a church, we were asked, and of course, being in that community, wanting to support our community, we said, sure, we'll be a part of that. We'll put, we'll put a float in the parade. So we began to talk. All right, so what will our float look like? And, you know, after kind of bouncing some ideas, we said, well, 
we are a church, right? So kind of makes sense we would do a nativity. So that became our plan. You know, we had someone in our church that had a flatbed trailer, you know, the kind where you, you, know, you could haul a car on it. We had some bales of hay to be in there. And, and not really to brag, but, you know, my wife and I, we got cast as Mary and Joseph for the parade. So just saying, uh, there's no speaking lines, and we mostly got the parts because we were willing to sit out and freeze. But, hey, to a couple theater people, we got the parts. That's all that matters, right? But we had some costumes for us. We had a couple of kids that had some costumes to be little shepherds. We had our little manger scene with a baby doll of Jesus in it. And for our extra little right on top, we had a pole with a star above it. That was our wonderful little float in our little manger scene, right? All ready to be a part of the parade. Of course, the night of the parade came, and there was an area where all of the floats were to gather to get lined up to start. And, you know, we pulled up and started getting things together. And as we started looking around at all the other participants, how should I put it to you? Imagine for a moment that you showed up to a black tie formal affair, and you were wearing blue jeans and a t-shirt. That's kind of how we felt. Right? Looking around, there were some incredible floats that were a part of this parade, detailed all up and down and lots of lights and color. You know, the fire department was there with a couple of trucks and their lights were going, the police. There's a nearby military base that had yeah, some military vehicles in it. The school band's a part of it. There was actually another church in town that did an incredible float. I was way jealous. It was a whole Grinch-themed float. They put together a sleigh. They had a Grinch. They had members of the church were all decked out as who's, you know, from Whoville, running around beside the float. I mean, it was incredible. And then there was our little float, if you want to call that. But, you know, probably biggest of all, and I mean that figuratively and literally, was, I would say, the main attraction of the whole parade. There was a giant, and I mean giant, shopping cart. But not just a giant shopping cart. I mean a shopping cart you can drive. Here's a picture. Take a look at this of, of one. And I actually think this is the one that was in the parade back then. Price Shopper put it on. So imagine this, what is it, two-story shopping cart that you can drive that shows up, and they had it all decked out in blue lights. You could miss, I'm pretty sure they could see it from space. I mean, this thing was all decked out with those lights there. And I remember as I'm kind of looking around, I look at that shopping cart, and everyone's staring, you know, talking about it. I'm like, you know, that's pretty much it, right? That sums it all up, because... Is there anything that would capture Christmas today any more than that giant shopping cart? You know, I love Christmas. That's well known. I love all of the stuff that goes into it, all the things that we do and decorations and food and music. But even I will admit that, you know, Christmas is this machine that you just can't stop. It, it actually really begins in the summertime, right? Like a snowball at the top of a mountain. You know, the craft stores start putting a few things out, and that snowball gets going. And then you get through back to school and into September, and all of a sudden it starts taking on a whole new life. And, you know, it starts chewing up other holidays along the way. And by the time you get to November, December, right, there is just no stopping it. And it's all of the shopping and the hustle and bustle and the decorations and the foods and the parties and all of the stuff that we often look forward to and sometimes kind of dread about the whole Christmas season. And as big as this holiday is, it's easy, as weird as it is to say this, to lose Christmas in Christmas. For Christmas to become simply all of that stuff. Certainly that's what the Grinch believed, right? You know, we all know the story of the Grinch, whether you like the original, you know, animated show that came on, or if you're talking about, you know, the live action version of Jim Carrey, the recent animated movie a couple of years ago, all of it has the same premise. The Grinch, right, the mini old Grinch, wants to stop Christmas from coming. So how do you do that? Right? How do you keep Christmas from coming? Well, if Christmas is about decorations and foods and, and lights and presents and, well, Get rid of all of it. Because if you don't have that stuff, there's no Christmas, right? So the Grinch steals Christmas. From house to house in Whoville, he takes all of it, even the crumbs left over for the mouse, right? Every little bit of it he takes. Because if all of that's gone, there can't be Christmas, right? Right? But we know what happens, don't we? 
we know that the Grinch learns that despite his efforts, despite taking all of it, Christmas still comes. Because Christmas is about more than all of the stuff. Christmas is about a child who was born for us. We hear one of the announcements of the birth of that child in Luke's gospel as an angel appears to a maiden named Mary. You know, we actually have a couple of these stories. Last week, we actually talked about the one from Matthew. In Matthew, we have an angel appearing to Joseph, who had become the father to Jesus, and and how he tells him what God was doing. But in Luke's account, we hear about the angel appearing to a young woman, a young maiden named Mary. Now, we don't really know much about her other than the fact that, well, she's not exactly who you would expect. If God's going to do something really important, you would think he would pick important people. And we don't get any indication that certainly she wasn't wealthy. She was very poor. She wasn't, you know, amongst the power, the lead, and, oh, this really great family. None of that kind of stuff. In fact, about the only thing we get is what we find here when the angel greets her. Look what the angel says in verse number 30. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. It's an interesting way to greet, right? You have found favor. Something about Mary. There was something there that God saw within her, says you. You will be the one who has this great privilege, this great honor, and this great responsibility. You know, we're told in Matthew's gospel that uh, Joseph was a righteous man. Well, I think there's no doubt that Mary was a righteous woman. If Joseph was a godly man, then Mary was a godly woman. And she is the one who is chosen to bear a son. But this son would not be like any other child, right? Look what the angel tells her about him. As he continues in this great message, in verse 32, he says, He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. This is what Christmas is really about. A child born to us, a child of the Most High, A child that the prophet Isaiah spoke about long, long ago. If we look back in Isaiah chapter 9, we hear what he says there in verse 6. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You can't stop Christmas because Christmas is about Christ, and Christ has already come. You can't stop Christmas because Christmas isn't about what we do. It's about what God does. And as the uh, angel reminded Mary when talking about how impossible all this seemed, what did he say? Verse number 37, for nothing Nothing will be impossible with God. You can't ruin Christmas. You can't stop Christmas. Because Christmas is about Jesus. It all comes back to Jesus. Now, it is well known how I feel about Christian cliches and Christmas cliches. I've talked about our former bishop, Dr. Bishop Robert Shenazy, and how he felt about some of those. You know, when you hear people say things like, Jesus is the reason for the season. Ugh. And yet, it's not wrong. Ooh, that's the worst part about it. It's not wrong, right? I hate the cliche. I hate the way it sounds. But it's still true. At the end of the day, Christmas is about Jesus. It is about God with us, God's Son being born for us, the one who was prophesied by Isaiah, the one who was announced to Joseph and Mary by the angel. It's all about Jesus. And nothing going on in the world can change that. 
No matter how many times we feel like we mess up Christmas and we can't find the perfect gift and the decorations aren't right, we, we overcook the cookies and whatever it may be, we're like, oh, no, we've messed it up. We've ruined Christmas. You can't ruin Christmas. You can't stop Christmas. And we just have to remind ourselves from that time to time that we don't lose sight and make Christmas about the stuff and not about Jesus. You know, in that parade those years ago, as we all started making our way down Main Street, I won't lie, I was a little embarrassed, right? You know, I'm like, Ugh, in the midst of all that and the who's running around everywhere and, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm kind of feeling bad about a little float and cold, which didn't help things either. And along the way, there was a kind of a grandstand area and there was an, an MC, right, an announcer. And as the floats would come by that main section, he would kind of describe what the float was and everybody were cheering and and I'm like, oh, this guy's going to earn his money tonight when he tries to up you know, our, uh, our float here a little bit. But as we came to it, as we moved in front of that area, things went quiet. There wasn't any cheering or clapping. And after a moment's pause, he said, and here we have a reminder of what Christmas is really about. And there was a few more seconds of just still. There was no applause, no cheering. And we made our way on down the street. And he began to talk about the next floats and the cheers came back. And, and I started thinking about that. And it stuck with me for days and really even weeks that, you know, it was good that we had such a humble little float and all of that, even in the shadow of the giant shopping cart. Because it was a reminder that Christmas really isn't about all of that other stuff. Those are things we do to celebrate Christmas. Make no mistake about it. And they're great and they're wonderful and we enjoy all of it. But Christmas at the end of the day is about a child who is God with us. And I think the challenge for us each and every year is to just simply not lose sight of that. To remember what it's about. You know, to keep Christ in Christmas, to use another one of those awful cliches that's still accurate, right? And, and we can do that in a lot of ways. You know, we sing the songs, and don't just sing the Christmas songs about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, but sing the songs that tell us about Jesus and the work of God in the world. Take time to read Christmas scriptures. You know, have a nativity in the midst of your decorations. You know, we've got all kinds of Santas and lights and decorations in our house, but we also have a little nativity, and it is simple. There is nothing fancy about it, but there was nothing fancy about the nativity to start with, right? A little something like that, just to kind of look in the middle of everything else. Oh, yeah, that's what it's about. You know, maybe it's, it, it's putting some chrismons on your tree. You know, chrismons are actually ornaments that are shaped as Christian symbols, Maybe it's a, a dove or a cross or a butterfly amongst many, many more. Maybe you have one or two hanging on your tree. Little things like that, that when you're sitting there and you're, you're looking at all the presents in the tree and you're looking at the decorations and you're really thinking, like, oh, this is going to be a great Christmas or, oh, this is going to be a terrible Christmas. No matter what you're thinking, you're looking at that and go, but it's always a great Christmas because it's not about what we do. It's about what God has done and what God will continue to do. We never can lose sight of that. You know, through the season, we light the candles of the Advent wreath. You know, they remind us of themes of the holidays and this season, especially in our faith. You know, this year we've been giving some different meanings, right? You know, there's, there's traditional ones. And this year we've been kind of looking at it a little differently, thinking about some aspects of the Christian faith we don't always do. You know, we let the first candle as a candle of joy, but not just joy to feel good and be happy, but joy, joy even when there is sorrow in our lives, even when things are broken and imperfect. The joy of God is still there because it comes from the love of God. Last week, we lit the second candle as a candle of grace, reminding us about the grace of God in Christ Jesus, that we are to forgive as God has forgiven us. Today, though, we're going to light the third candle. This third candle today, I want to light as a candle of celebration. Not the celebration of all of the lights and decorations and presents, but that it reminds us to celebrate what God has done, 
what God is doing, and what we believe in faith that God will still do. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, forgive us for the many ways that we lose sight of Christmas. For the times that we make Christmas to be more about presents and decorations than we do about you and your presence with us. Help us, God, in the midst of the chaos of the world and the chaos of the holiday to never forget that Christmas still comes. And Christmas is always perfect for you for Jesus is perfect. We pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Let us all with one accord sing 
praises to our heavenly Lord, born is the King of kings, hallelujah. Well, he raised the dead, made blind men see, the sick were healed and the captive freed, so all can praise his name. like one of my absolute favorite songs. It's a uh, Leonard Cohen made popular by Jeff Buckley. And uh, those lyrics are great. Uh, uh, not the traditional lyrics, but very Christmassy and fit well. So um, we are going to end with what's now kind of become one of our Christmas traditions. Uh, this is an athletic rendition of the song. <laughs> oh, come all you faithful. All right, here we go. One, two, ready, and <laughs>
Huzzah! Huzzah! The people of God say amen. Amen. All right, that is our service for the week. Um, you guys, um, do keep Christ in Christmas. He is the reason for the season, and as we groan, um, don't lose sight of that. That is, that is everything. Um, we do have a Chiefs game in about 30 minutes. Um, we've already locked our playoff hope, but we uh, wish the boys well. Um, just keep Mahomes safe. We don't even really need him today. I'll, I'll go play quarterback. If it, you know, yeah, go Chiefs. And um, anyway, run the race, fight the fight. Join us next week um, as we uh, encroach on the spirit of Christmas. Um, we are First Light. Thank you guys for tuning in this week, and we'll catch up with you next week. between you I take the seasick crocodile Quote. 